Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's CAUSE Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education webinar. Um, I'm so excited to be uh, introducing and moderating today. My name is Nick Horton from Amherst College, um, and I just wanted to remind people that this webinar will be recorded and it will be posted on the CAUSE webinar in the next few days. Couldn't be more excited to introduce this topic and these speakers today. Um, we have Mina Chetinkaya Rundell and Alex Reinhardt who are gonna be talking today. But before I get started with what promises to be a really interesting conversation, um, I just wanted to kind of start with a couple of, um, couple of other points. So um, this is the reinvigorated um, joint webinar series for the Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education. There are other webinars that are happening. Um, so, you know, even next week we have the webinar on teacher education curriculum materials. Um, in uh, February, we're gonna have a, uh, another one from this joint series on Bayesian methods in the statistics curriculum. And then also one on one of the papers in this special issue, playing the whole game and data scraping for fun and profit um, on March 23rd. All these webinars are free. They're available for sign up on the CAUSE website at the link here, and we'll be posting these slides as well uh, after the recording is posted. Just a little bit more on CAUSE. Uh, CAUSE is a consortium for the advancement of undergraduate statistics education. Um, there's lots of information and resources on the CAUSE website. One of the things I wanted to note, since it's now the end of January, that there are deadlines for a number of uh, ways to engage with the US COTS, the United States Conference on Teaching Statistics Conference uh, 2021. This will be virtual, the first time a virtual conference for, um, for US COTS, but the program committee has been creatively putting thoughts together on making that really engaging and to really expand opportunities. So um, take a look there, um, definitely sign up, register when registration opens, uh, but those are kind of some interesting related things I wanted to mention. So let me turn to our speakers and then kind of get going on uh, today's conversation. Mina Chetikaya Rundell is senior lecturer in the School of Mathematics at the University of Edinburgh. She's also data scientist and professional educator at our studio. And last but not least, also an associate professor of the practice at the Department of Statistical Science at Duke University. Mina's work focuses on innovation in statistics and data science pedagogy with an emphasis on computing, reproducible research, student-centered learning, and open source education, as well as pedagogical approaches for enhancing retention of women and underrepresented minorities in STEM. Mina works on integrating computation into the undergraduate statistics curriculum using reproducible research methodologies as well as the analysis of real and complex data sets. She's a fellow of the ASA, elected member of the ISI, as well as the winner of the 2018 Harvard Picard Award and of the 2016 Waller Education Award. I'm also pleased that we have Alex Reinhardt. Alex is an assistant teaching professor uh, of statistics and data science at Carnegie Mellon University, where he also received his PhD in statistics. His research interests include spatial temporal point processes and statistical pedagogy. He lead, helps lead the teaching statistics research group on how students learn statistics. And while in graduate school, he published Statistics Done Wrong, a popular book on common ways scientists misuse statistics. Among his many other activities, he's a member of the Delphi group at CMU and helps lead its COVID-19 response efforts, including its symptom surveys. But again, I'm, I had the great pleasure of, of a special guest uh, who's joined us today. Um, I'd like to introduce Joe, Har uh, Joe Harden from Pomona College. Um, Joe is a professor of statistics at Pomona, fellow of the ASA, recipient of a number of national awards for teaching. Joe's research involves the high throughput analysis of human genome data, as well as many innovative aspects of pedagogy and teaching. She was a guest editor for the special issue on the undergraduate statistics curriculum published in 2015 in the American Statistician and is also co-guest editor for this special issue on computing and the statistics and data science curriculum. And Joe is gonna be really introducing and, and setting the stage for today's conversation. Great, thank you, Nick, appreciate it. 
So it's my job, um, or my pleasure rather, to uh, to kind of give you a little bit of background and a little bit of information about the special issue that uh, that Nick and I put together, the special issue of what is now the Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education. So, um, so the special issue, the idea for the special issue came out of conversations about the Nolan and Temple Lang seminal paper, Computing in the Statistics Curriculum, which was published in the American Statistician in 2010. Um, so, uh, you know, among a number of questions that they that they asked in their paper, they um, they really made a, a point that computing um, really plays a bigger role than maybe people were thinking at the time. They they said, you know, computing is as fundamental to statistical practice as mathematics is. So so really, um, you know, uh, some provocative statements imploring us to define statistical computing more broadly and to um, to reason about computational resources, work with large data sets, um, you know, and, and just have a really much broader uh, view on computing in the statistics curriculum. So one of the, the pieces in their paper is this Venn diagram. And in 2010, if as a statistician, if you look at this Venn diagram, you're thinking to yourself, that's not statistics. And, um, you know, Nolan and, and Temple Lang were pretty prescient in the sense that they, they were aware of how important these concepts were, uh, you know, all across the, the spectrum of, of computing techniques, um, you know, that, that might have had homes in, in uh, CS departments or, um, you know, even, even in, in math spaces and, and, and whatnot. Okay. Um, so, so like I said, we were having conversations about this paper and, and, and Nick, of, these are all Nick's great ideas. Um, Nick says, you know, we should, we should put together a special issue sort of thinking about what has happened since then. So we had a call for papers in 2019 um, and spent 2020 uh, working through those papers. And, um, and uh, the, the special issue is, is imminent. It's, it's about to come out. All the papers are already online. It's just a few uh, technical, you know, uh, making sure everything comes together. So, uh, so any minute now, the special issue will, will be at your front desk. So what is the special issue? Um, well, it contains an editorial um, and, uh, and then a commentary from, from Deb and Duncan, Duncan on what, what they see as having taken place over the last 10 years. Um, and then there are 14 papers that Nick and I have, um, have you know, read carefully and thought about what do these 14 papers have in common and, and how, how can we sort of categorize the changes in the last 10 years. And we, and we came up with these three groups. So, um, so there are papers that speak to creative teaching structures. There are papers that um, have sort of novel skills and habits. And then there are papers that really implore us to think more carefully and deeply about computational thinking. And Nick has put the link in the, in the chat. For those of you, the editorial um, contains the, the links to every single one of the papers in the special issue. So if you just go to the references section of the editorial, you can you can get to all the papers. Okay. So um, so I'm going to now just go through a couple of the papers from from the special issue, um, and then I'll leave it up to Mina and Alex to talk um, uh, more deeply about their papers, uh, which are two of the papers in the in the special issue. Okay. So um, so you may have found it difficult to bring some of these um, some of these ideas to your classroom because of technological hurdles. So there are two papers in the um, in the special issue which speak to those technological hurdles. Um, easy to use cloud computing uh, does it through containers says you know here's a great way to set up containers using Jupyter notebooks github and binder um, and they like many of the issue many of the um, articles they uh, provide excellent resources and and you know all of their code is available and all of their work is available so having that cloud-based computing um, another group has uh, describes a, a integrated learning environment. One of the really, um, uh, really cool things that they have online is they have um, a, an online coding platform where two students can work um, at in separate places on the same document. So you might think about like a Google Doc, 
right? So like you and your friend are, are both typing on a Google doc at the same time. You can do that through aisle. Um, and aisle additionally has lots of applets and lots of, uh, probability um, uh, resources. So it's really just this large integrated platform that helps you get started with your students really immediately on day one. And then there's a bunch of papers that, um, that help all of us stay on top of the changing world. So I don't know about you, but I'm certainly um, often sort of um, nervous about all of these new things that are coming out and how do I learn and how do I teach? Uh, so, so again, there's a couple here. This is one by Mine and Mine um, about web scraping. And like the other papers, they've provided a ton of really fantastic resources that um, allow you to get up and running, teaching your students how to get their own data through um, scraping HTML documents. You know, you could take what they've done and, and even just have an assignment where your students were doing something like scraping Wikipedia pages or something like that, but just really teaching, um, yeah. Uh, this is a paper I wrote with my colleague Albert Kim at um, Smith, and he's going to be talking about um, uh, he's going to be talking about this paper in more detail in an upcoming webinar. And um, and what we did was we had students fill out a Google Calendar, whether it be just a fake Google Calendar or their own actual Google Calendar, and then do a little data analysis on it and realize how hard that um, data collection. Uh, process is. So for example, one of the things we realized is that if you have an ongoing appointment, like let's say you jog every day at seven in the morning and you have that on your calendar, well, the way the data analysis, the way it gets downloaded is as a single event. So the student only gets credit for running one time, which is kind of a problem. So kind of thinking about how is data recorded and, and used um, in, in a lot of these automated ways. Um, here's another one where uh, where they talk about how to use Twitter in the classroom as, as a research project. Um, really fantastic, um, you know, full project of, of getting the data, you know, uh, scraping the tweets and then using some language processing, some, I think they use latent Dirichlet allocation to, to group the tweets and whatnot. Um, and one of the highlights of this paper is that they have a, a fantastic um, rubric for, uh, for assessing research projects. So if you go to this paper and you look through, um, you know, that might be something that, that works for you for any sort of computational um, or non-computational, I guess, research project and, and um, uh, you know, a little tool there. And, and last, um, this is a, a paper about uh, multivariable thinking and, and the tools needed to uh, really help your students get, um, get to a place where they're fluent in working with multivariable computational techniques. And, uh, and this paper has lots of, of fun pieces in it, um, but I pull out this quote because it, it really speaks a lot to this, this change from 2010 to now. Um, and they say proficiency in a statistical programming language facilitates the development of multivariable thinking by giving the students tools to investigate complex data. So it's really those tools that are changing how the students think and they're changing their, the students' ability to work with data. So, uh, so really these computational things aren't just tricks, but, but tools. Um, so, so right, so there's a couple of papers that really speak to this computational thinking. Uh, and this is one of them where, where these authors did a survey of sort of uh, data science and statistics courses. And they, they went back to Deb, Deb and Duncan's Venn diagram and they said, which of the topics that Deb and Duncan put out there are people covering today? And, and it's actually better than you might think that quite a few um, courses are using a lot of the ideas that, that were put out in that 2010 paper. The blue ones you know, are covered in 75%, the orange ones covered in at least 50% of the courses. The gray ones were not asked in the survey and, and the ones that aren't highlighted are ones that were asked in the survey but that people aren't really um, teaching uh, quite a bit. But, but you know, wait, can you go back, Nick? So, so I want to just point out one of the things that the, that these authors say um, is is that you know we've gotten to a place where maybe we are teaching these ideas and we see the value to them, but but there's this additional piece which is really important for right now, is that are the students um, really understanding 
what the what the role of these computational tools um, is and, and what these computational tools are doing. So are we developing students who understand and not just have an ability to use um, these ideas as a black box? Okay. And then two last papers um, really just that highlight uh, this idea of computational thinking and, and the role it plays in in how we're doing analyses and how we're thinking about more um, sort of sophisticated modeling. Um, so the first one talks about debugging um, and and really the ability to work through code and 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 figure out what went wrong um, is so central to being able to then uh, you know take that analysis one step further um, in a in a in a other in a second paper on on uh, providing workshops, um, the authors talk about uh, you know ideas that you might not necessarily spend a lot of time thinking about or teaching things like looping functions, conditional statements, you know if statements. So so how important those ideas are to teach because they they really get at those ideas of computational thinking and and how that um, then works within the statistical modeling framework. So anyway, hopefully that wet your appetite for this fantastic special issue, which is coming out any day now. Um, but again, all the papers are already online, so you can go read them um, to your heart's delight. And without further ado, um, Mine and Alex will now uh, talk to you about their work um, in their in their papers, which are contained in the special issue. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for the introduction and the overview, uh, Nick and Joe. So um, I'll talk about my our paper called A Fresh Look at Introductory Data Science. Um, and this was authored by me and also um, Victoria Ellison, who was at Duke when we uh, first started working on this. She was a postdoc there um, and she's now at UIUC. So um, I wanted to start with this figure because it kind of gives you an overview of what's happening in this course. And the paper itself is a case study, basically, of this introductory data science course, which is designed for undergraduates. And I'm underlying design there because it's designed with an audience of no programming background in mind. But over the years of teaching this course, we've had many requests of people who have some level of programming background or even graduate students from perhaps other disciplines wanting to uh, take part in it. So while it's designed for that audience, it is all, uh, generally taught as open to all. And another thing I'll mention about the um, the curriculum that I'll be describing is that um, the curriculum was designed at Duke and it's still being taught there as well. Over the last couple of years, I've been at the University of Edinburgh and have been basically teaching this practically the same curriculum with logistical changes just due to the academic system differences here. But in terms of portability, I think it's a case study on its own that it is portable from uh, institution to institution. Um, so one of the things when writing about data science is this question, what is data science? And I love avoiding answering that question head on because I feel like we get nowhere. So I thought we should take a statistician's approach to answering that question instead approach it empirically and did a survey of courses, introductory data science courses that we knew of. Um, so I'm not necessarily claiming this is a representative sample, but these are courses that had good web presence that we could find information on easily and we try to distribute kind of um sizes of universities and also wanted to have at least one non-US university in there. And looking at their online uh, like posted uh, syllabus, we have categorized the topics that which you can see in the rows of this table and then took a look at how much time they're spending on each and calculated kind of percentage of time spent on each one to give us a lay of the land of what's being taught out there when we say introductory data science and where does the course we teach at Duke fit into that. We then contacted the um, course in design instructors just to verify that we weren't completely off base in our calculations and have made minor modifications and then ended up with this table basically. This was great. Uh, it was like a good way of finding out about what's out there and hopefully again allowed us to circumvent that question in one some way or another. Um, so what is in the paper? So each of those learning units that I showed on the image, exploring data, 
uh, making rigorous conclusions and looking further. For each one of these, we outline specific learning goals, as well as justification based on literature for why we chose those particular learning goals. We also give case study examples. So actually talking about what does a homework assignment uh, in this unit look like? What data set does it cover? What computational competencies does it address? Um, also give some idea about pacing of topics. And um, another feature, not so much of the paper, but of the course that is the basis for this paper is that all of the materials uh, that, that for this course is openly available at datasciencebox.org. So if you are, once you read the paper, interested in adopting the curriculum in floral or in part, uh, you can go ahead and take a look at all the bits and pieces. I was also inspired as I was preparing these slides uh, by this figure from one of the other papers of like mapping on to the um, the Venn diagram from the Nolan Templeing paper. So I actually outlined the competencies we do cover in the course. And you'll see that except for the computational statistics box, we are actually hitting a lot of them at a first course in data science. I'll also note that in the web technologies, I circled a blank because we totally cover web technologies like web scraping, but I would say it's more like HTML and CSS. And I don't even know what SOAP is, is what I realized. <laughs> so I think that some of the technologies um, that are commonly taught potentially have changed, but there is something in there. It's just not one of the ones that has outlined in the original paper. Um, so in addition to that, there's also a good bit of write-up on the pedagogical choices, especially the team-based aspect of things, the computing infrastructure, without which I think none of this would be possible. So we use uh, cloud-based computing and setting up the students' computing environments to be able to run all of this seamlessly to kind of computing newbies, if you will. Um, also outline the computing competencies that students acquire, like they work with Git and GitHub, and they use R and a particular set of packages. So we talk about those as well as how we assess the students. And I think also importantly, at a curricular level, we discuss the impact of the course on the undergraduate curriculum at Duke. Um, having our students, even though this was not originally designed as a prerequisite for the major, it is now accepted as one of the major elective courses. And it has really informed how we're teaching our second uh, course in regression, as well as allowed us to push our third year stack computing course a lot further. And I've heard nothing but positive things from faculty who teach these upper level courses saying, I'm so glad that students are coming in with these competencies so we can actually dive into some of the statistical topics a lot quicker. And finally, I'd like to address why is it a fresh look at introductory data science? Um, I think here are the reasons why, and they may perhaps vary in terms of level of freshness, but when you look at the landscape of data science education, I think they do rank up there. Um, first of all, we introduce programming via visualization. So there's no like, here is R, and this is like basic R syntax. We start making data visualizations from minute one. Um, there's reproducible workflows and emphasis on those, and also skills around the data science lifecycle, things like web scraping to get the data in and clean it. Um, modeling over inference is another aspect of the course that I'd be happy to elaborate on if there are questions. Um, and also built in flexibility for evolution of topics. As new technologies or topics come into play, there's room in the curriculum to perhaps let go of something else and bring that in. And as well as a uh, big emphasis on collaborative work and technologies like working with GitHub to support that collaborative work. Great. Well, Mina, thank you very much. That was a fabulous um, kind of high level overview. And Joe, thanks again for setting the stage in terms of these papers. Um, Alex, I think there's a chance for you to kind of give us a sense of, of your paper. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so what I'm going to talk about a little bit is what we described in our paper, um, Chris Genovese and I, um, which kind of steering in a slightly different direction. So what we asked was, um, what not what should an introductory course look like, but for a graduate student, like a master's or PhD graduate in statistics and data science, what would we like them to be able to do with computing when they're graduated and all going off to industry to be a data scientist and make more money than we do? Um, and what we realized, um, started designing this course 
over five years ago now is that um, students are often as or statisticians or graduate or graduates are often called on to deliver what I call a statistical product, not an analysis. That is, over the past 10 years or so, we've seen loads of progress on things like our markdown, Jupyter notebooks, um, data wrangling, tidyverse, all these tools that make it easier to deliver an analysis with the graphics, with the data um, and everything. But often what our students off in industry have to do is say they, you know, they're tasked by their manager to build a model to predict something, but instead of delivering a report, that model gets used every day by the business to do something. It's software they produce that gets integrated with their app or with their website or with their whatever the company's product is. Um, there was an example we quote from Airbnb where they made a pricing model to suggest, you know, if you want to rent out your spare room on Airbnb, what price should you list it at? And their team built a model to try to predict this, but it's not just deliver a report and interpret the coefficients, that model has to get used every day and someone has to check on it, make sure it's working well and so on. And to do this kind of thing, to be delivering software um, that implements statistics, um, you need to be as much a software engineer as a statistician. So you need to know the topics, how do I build software that can be maintained over a long period of time? How do I build a complicated software that takes data from seven different parts of the company and integrates it? Um, and all these things, much more than just um, syntax of a language or specific technologies. Um, so we have a set of lecture notes and materials we developed um, on the website, which I see has also been pasted in the chat. Thank you. Uh, make that easy to find. Uh, and you'll also see there it describes some of the pedagogy, which I am about to describe. Um, so uh, in this course, the course we developed was a first semester course that our masters and PhD students um, at CMU took. And the goal was to give them ex experience designing and maintaining complicated software. So not just, you know, hundreds of lines of code to go into a report, but building something complicated that gets run repeatedly that they have to go back and change later and so on. Much like uh, those of you who did PhDs in statistics, think of code you wrote for your thesis that you had to maintain over many months or years. Uh, that type of thing. Uh, so to do this, uh, the course structure involved several, involves a semester long project that the students do. Uh, for instance, one of the projects involves building um, uh, implementation of classification trees, then integrating that with a SQL database so you can load the information for a database, then scraping papers from archive and using your classification tree to classify the papers. Um, and the core feature of this, there's also some homework assignments, but the core feature of this is a process um, of revision and mastery grading. That is, um, after the first semester I graded this course when everyone ignored all the comments I made on their homework, like students are wont to do, uh, we implemented a strategy whereby either they do, they fix the things we asked them to do or they don't get credit. And so there's no numeric grades, it's simply your assignment is good, or here are some detailed comments through pull requests on GitHub, please fix them. Um, and that was great. It meant we actually cut the amount of homework in about half because we could force students to make their homework a lot better instead of doing more of it. Um, and along with that, to, to deliver this message of designing software rather than just analyses, um, the course content could be described as all of undergraduate computer science in one semester. Uh, it's uh, design, unit testing, object-oriented programming, functional programming, databases. Uh, there's a little bit about neural networks now. Um, we cover some design principles, do lots of activities where students try to think about how to design and maintain software. We do code review in class so they can see um, how things work. But our hope here is that by doing all of this, um, those who go on to do their PhD in a much better place to, um, you know, maintain their, the package they're making for their thesis or all the simulation code and so on. And those who go on to industry uh, can go work on an interdisciplinary team, building, you know, a fancy new app, making loads of money, uh, and they'll have the software tools they need to do that. Great, Alex. Well, thank you very much. Um, and again, thank you to you and Mina and, and also to Joe for really setting the stage um, here today. Um, we've got some good questions coming in. We'd love to hear your questions 
as well. So please kind of add those to the chat um, as they come in. Um, let us know if there's anything else we can be providing in terms of this. But but I wanted to kind of start um, with this role as moderator of, of beginning with the questions that, that Deb Nolan and Duncan Temple Lang posed 11 years ago. Um, and they're, they're related and interrelated. And um, I think the good news is our job today was just to kind of be provocative and encourage you to check out the special issue where lots of these things are discussed in more detail and not to solve many of the problems that, that we have. But, but Mina, I'm wondering if you'd be willing to kind of take a stab at, at question two about whether or not we, whatever we is, you can define that how you like, provide students, and again, at what level, you described an introductory course, but there is also kind of, you know, minors or majors in statistics, data science. Um, but do we provide students the essential skills needed to engage in statistical problem solving and to keep abreast of new technologies as they evolve? I, I'd really be interested in your thought on that. Um, I think we are thriving to do that. And I would say that more so more recently than perhaps a decade ago, which is closer to when I started uh, teaching as well. So I think there's a key uh, term there, statistical problem solving. And I feel like it's about how you define what a statistical problem is um, in order to be able to teach the essential skills for it. So I mentioned earlier the data science life cycle. I call it the data science life cycle, but I think any statistician, you know, looking at it would say, yeah, that's exactly what I do as well. Somebody sends me a data set and I kind of need to clean it first before I can do anything with it. Um, I think a lot of this stuff was in our pipeline already as statisticians, but much of the uh, stuff that happened prior to modeling perhaps wasn't as emphasized in our coursework. And when it's not as emphasized in our coursework, I think what ends up happening is we end up diminishing the importance of that in the student's mind. And they kind of think they can like hand wave through it. But some of the decisions you make when you're cleaning your data can be extremely important. Say you have a factor with many levels, how you collapse that down, you could be making really important decisions about about people's lives at that point, if that's the sort of data you're working with. So both being aware of that, but also having the computational skills to quickly prototype a few things and not feel like you have to settle on a decision right away, but be able to run your models with option A and option B and really think about it. I think we need the computational skills to be able to do that. The other side of that question, the other part is keep abreast of new technology. So this is something I will say that I really thrive to do in my class. And I'll give a very kind of toy example of one of the ways you can address this is uh, one of the things I ask my students to do is to just pick a our package and do something with it, something I haven't taught them. So what that means is they have to learn to read some documentation to be able to do something minor. Because I think designing a good curriculum, especially at the undergraduate level, at times does feel a bit like spoon feeding some of the technologies to students because we want them to be introduced in a particular way that doesn't feel overwhelming. But I think we wanna give them some experience with uh, trying things out as well. And that's also true when it comes to like open ended projects and stuff. And if, you know, participation in things like open ended hackathons is any indication, I think students are quite fine with the, like quite interested in doing these things. As educators, one of the challenges I feel like we have is when you leave things open ended and tell the students, this is your playground, go play and learn. How do we then fairly assess stuff so students yeah. don't get yeah. frustrated yeah. is, I think, an important question that I don't have superb answers for, but we have to keep in mind as we kind of broaden our curricula. Yeah, Mina, I, I think that's really exciting. I also think, you know, not that you need more projects to do, but the pick an R package and riff on it assignment could be a wonderful poster presentation uh, submission for US COTS. Joe, do you have anything else you want to add on this front? 
Yeah, I do. Um, so for me, when I look at this question, I of course see it through my own lens, which is as an instructor. And so, um, so it's not just about um, the students keeping abreast of new technologies. It's about me keeping abreast of new technologies. And and you know, if I value this question, if I value you know what what um, Nolan and Temple Lang are saying, that means that I have somehow got to figure all this stuff out. You know, on top of my day job. And um, and one of the things that I've started doing is I literally have a one hour every Tuesday that I do tidy Tuesday and I've opened it up to students um, now in the in the pandemic we just do it online you know together we just live code together um, but it's it's like Mine was just saying it's super open-ended N- nobody has to grade anything I don't have to grade um, and uh, and and they see me struggling in fact this morning we were doing it and I couldn't figure out how to make these color palettes work and they helped me a little bit and we we did a bunch of googling to figure it out but i just feel like if you can if you can sort of force yourself or somehow you know read one paper a week or something like that or just you know somehow read some tweets or something just to kind of stay up with how things are changing it really helps within those ideas of bringing it to the to the classroom to make sure that that the students are, are staying abreast also great joe i love that idea of how you're making yourself putting yourself out there and being vulnerable and for the students to see that you don't know all things um, and that you're kind of modeling the learning we want them to be doing in various ways. I think this question for me is also interesting because thinking back maybe you know 12 years when they wrote this or 13 or 14 as they were developing the workshops that led to the, this paper, um, I think it was lo- a lot of the case where people would know how to deal with end going to infinity, but couldn't deal with 100,000 rows as Thomas Lumley has said. I think there may have been some graduates from undergraduate statistics programs who never learned how to write a function. Um, And I think there were many courses, dare I say programs, where all the data sets were in CSV files at the end of the book, which last time I checked was not how they show up in the real world. And so I think we've made a lot of progress over the intervening decade, but I think there's more, more to be doing. Um, Alex, I, I'd love if you'd be willing to kind of dive in on this third question. You know, it, it's related to some of the things you've already talked about, but do our students build the confidence needed to overcome computational challenges to, for, for example, reliably design and run a synthetic experiment or carry out a comprehensive data analysis? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And I think there is two words in that question that are the operative ones. So first is confidence. Do the students build the confidence? Uh, and I see um, in the students I've interacted with sometimes a, a dichotomy. So you have some students who um, they're not much programming background and sometimes feel almost afraid of it. You know, they don't, they want to ask you, what happens if I write this code this way? And you could say, well, try it, but they're afraid to try it because something might break and they don't know what will happen. Um, and those students, you know, they progress, of course, through the courses. But you end up seeing a large cohort, and we've seen this some of our programs, we see we have a lot of students like this who are very much the reverse. Uh, you give them any problem and they come back a week later and they're like, yeah, I found something on Stack Overflow and I found this package that does the thing and I put these three things together and here, here's a thing I made up, some analysis I put together. Uh, but sometimes it's pretty impressive. They've gone off and found all kinds of tools you never even heard of Uh, and put them together to solve the problem. Um, But I'm going to take a moment to get on my soapbox and point out the second word in there that I think is interesting, which is reliably design. Because one question is, you know, can our students write code that doesn't experiment or analyze this data? But what about reliably? Uh, And one of the things um, that we've seen in practice and learn from software engineering is that's actually a hard thing. So there's a famous example a few years ago of data analysis software for magnetic resonance imaging that had been used in many, many studies of the brain where they had a bug in their p-value calculation and all the p-values were too small. Um, And so one thing I worry about is when people write statistical software, the quality of that software and correctness of that software? And do we teach our students to build their software in ways that it's easy to tell if it's correct and that they've checked that it's correct? 
And I think that one is one we may be missing, except at the higher levels when they start learning to write functions and write unit tests uh, and so on. Uh, I think if you submit a paper where you've written a bunch of functions or do an analysis where you've written a bunch of functions to do stuff to your data and fit models and so on, and you've never written unit tests for it, that feeling to me is much like the feeling you get when you realize, wait, did I leave the oven on? Like there, or something like that. Like there should be this deep feeling of unease at doing that. Uh, and I try to instill that with our graduate course, um, but I'm not sure how to instill that um, in the students. And that's something I like to work on. Great, I, again, I think that's a really, really important point, Alex. Um, these issues, I think, also relate to some of the points that Mina said. How the heck do we assess this? How do we do that in a fair and useful and, and inclusive way? Um, a lot of these questions came up a little bit in some of the um, keynotes, uh, you know, um, Hadley Wickham's keynote from our Studio Global um, this week. And I, I know there were thousands of people uh, part of that. Um, but again, you know, this, this kind of challenge for us of kind of thinking about maintaining the key parts of kind of the statistics curriculum that really help people to kind of be posed and answering questions, but to do so in a way that's using far more sophisticated tools um, than, you know, than these students' parents, um, maybe not also the, the instructors. Um, but again, I think those are great ones for us. Um, Joe, there's a question um, that's come in. Um, you know, someone thanks us for sharing about uh, the computing expectations for undergraduate majors, uh, grad students, um, um, if there's time um, to hear about the role of computing of interest stat for non-majors, um, should computing replace the statistical co concepts for this audience? Um, what's the core to keep? What do you make, make, make room for? You know, we know that the revised Gaze College Report redefined technology to not include calculators, right? That's not how people do um, statistics in the real world. Um, but I don't know if you have any thoughts, Joe, on that front in the context of these other parts and pieces. I, I don't have, I haven't really thought through carefully, um, you know, uh, about the replacing and, and how to fit everything in. But one of the things I have been thinking about a lot lately is, is how we think and talk about the role of computing. And, um, and so, for example, instead of teaching, this is a histogram, this is a box plot, you know, here's how you make this one, here's how you make that one, and the computer will do it for you, um, that, that you can say, hey, here's a gallery of plots and here's a data set. Which of these plots sort of tells you what information about that data set, right? So like really thinking, um, you know, using the computer to help you understand the data instead of to help you do something to the data, you know, that, that's already been done. Um, so another, another uh, example I have for that is with maximum likely or with uh, least squares regression, right? Understanding what the computer is doing to minimize least squares um, is, is, really so important to understanding what the statistical analysis is. Um, you know, and, and also that that's a little bit arbitrary that we're minimizing the squares instead of the absolute values and, and whatnot. And, and one of the things I've been thinking about is, is, is um, uh, you know, when we are teaching a student how to do a proof in a, in a math class, you know, the student might come to the math class and, um, and say, okay, or come to the, the theorem, I need to prove this theorem, and they might know, they might see the pieces that says, I've got to use proof by induction. That's the thing. I can do that. I know proof by induction, and I get n equals one, and then n equals k, and, you know, I can do that. But what they really need to understand is why is it that proof by induction is the thing that argues the theorem. Why is it that those logical steps convince you that the theorem is true? Not just that we need to do those steps, but why? And so I'm trying to like wrap my head around how can I use the computer such that the student's understanding what's going on? So it's not so much of a replace this topic with this topic, but it's a replace how I talk about it and a replace how the assignments engage with those. Great. Um, no, I think I think that sounds um, that's really helpful, Joe. I'd like to turn to some of the questions. Please um, continue to add those questions um, onto the uh, Q and A. Um, and the question I'd like to kind of pitch to Alex um, is just a little bit more, you know, detail for you about the what are the computer science prerequisites 
um, you know, for your course? What kind of, and, and, and do you have a sense of how students, you know, what, what, what can they do um, at the end of that course? I always describe my students being dangerous at the end of my courses, but <laughs> I, I, I'd be interested in your, your sense on that. Yes, so the computing prerequisite question is a good one. So most of the students who take that course, uh, they were admitted to the master's or PhD program in statistics. So most likely they've had some undergraduate courses where they did some R or something like that, or maybe Python, took an intro Python class once. Um, but there's no formal prerequisite that you need to have covered certain CS topics. Um, this does pose a challenge in that you get students who've programmed, you know, they fit some linear models in R before, and that's the extent of it. And you get students who did an undergraduate CS major uh, and everything in between. Uh, and that poses a lot of challenges in teaching the course. Um, I think, though, the structure we have both of requiring revision in assignments, which means you can submit something that's not very good and you will get told how to make it better. Um, and also we have a structure where we have a bank of homework problems for students to choose from rather than mandatory ones. And so if you basically, you don't have to learn every single topic in the course. Uh, the goal is rather for you to be able to do the project and whatever topics uh, might be most relevant to your interests or to your future needs. Um, so there aren't formal prerequisites for the students, uh, but it is, when students have such a huge range of backgrounds, it is quite challenging. Um, and I think there was a second part to your question that I've forgotten now. <laughs> uh, and how do you, you know, how do you sense whether that they've actually achieved that? Oh uh, yes, how dangerous are they? Um, <laughs> so, well, I think the thing that shows it in our course is the projects, how well they do on the projects. Uh, because the project is all semester long and it grants them a lot of freedom to try things. Uh, and so the, the great thing in the project in this course is when a student who knew very little R before or needed lots of help um, can get through and they've built a fully functioning classification tree program by the end. Um, so I've heard back from students who graduated and went off to job saying, you know, I've gone off to my job and I'm writing Python all day. Thank you so much for forcing me to do that huge project that I hated because now I'm writing code all day long. Um, so I think that and seeing um, their work in subsequent classes has encouraged me to think, you know, they are, they are getting a lot out of this. It, it feels like a lot of work at the time, but it does prepare them in a lot of ways they don't realize. Great, great, thanks. I'm going to take my moderator's prerogative and answer one of the questions here uh, that, that says unit testing is a bit advanced. At what level would it be appropriate to introduce it to our students? And, and I, I kind of think about that a little bit differently. It's true that software engineering, which is where a lot of those kind of parts and pieces come from, is buried deep, deep, deeper than our theoretical statistics course, I might add, in the computer science curriculum. You got CS0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You take some other courses, then you get to the software engineering course. I think it's critical for us to be thinking about what aspects particularly at the undergraduate level, which is where I teach. My students are gonna be doing data wrangling. Almost all of their job is data wrangling. So we need to be teaching, I think in the introductory data science course immediately afterwards, if not, um, um, you know, to kind of get them to say, hey, I'm gonna check my data to make sure that ages are non-negative. Hey, I'm gonna check it. And when I get a new data set that it automatically does that kind of, kind of parts and pieces. Um, Joe and I did, um, along with Hunter Glanz from Cal Poly, uh, did a teaching data science blog. And we talked about kind of data consistency checking using tools that I agree are mostly for kind of people who are writing R packages at a level beyond what I'm teaching. But these general questions I think are really, you know, really valuable for us to start to think about in the same way code style is important. We can't just slap stuff down um, and expect students either to get jobs or to be able to do effective statistics or data science. Mina, do you have anything else you want to add on to that? Yeah, the one thing I wanted to add about testing is I feel like I used to think that that might be advanced as well because I was thinking, well, I'm not writing a piece of software. I'm writing data analysis code. But if you actually look at data analysis code, many of us write, there's things like 
n row like give me the number of rows of this thing and then there's like a little comment next to it that says yes checks out or something like that so basically if you wrap that in a if this is not positive stop running my code that becomes a test so i think actually as statisticians we are very used to doing unit tests. It's just we know, we maybe don't traditionally write our code in a way where it stops running or gives us some sort of indication through the programming language. So it's just turning your mental notes into, I think, uh, tests, which I feel like at this point, whenever you can offload that stuff to the computer, that seems like a win. Okay, great. While you're, while you're on a kind of, kind of quick question for you, Mina, is there a not too technical reference on how to write either good documentation for a program or how to write a good uh, data dictionary or code book? Yeah, so for, um, for documentation, I'm going to put a link in the chat here that I think I find that uh, particular uh, reference quite useful for thinking about different types of documentation based on who your audience is and at what level um, at what point in their consumption of your software they're going to be using that documentation. There's a little video at the bottom of it as well. And it's not super technical. And I think it's really informative regardless of whether you're doc writing documentation for educational purposes or generally for software. I don't have a good reference like that for code books either, but I, I, I will give the one example that I you know ask my students to do an open-ended project. And as part of it, you know, they do this in a GitHub repository and there's a data folder and they are required to have a readme that has a code book in it. And the way I try to tell them what makes a good code book is I give a few examples from well-documented R packages, like whatever comes up when you do the help uh, or the question mark. And I ask them at a minimum to replicate that, which will have definitions of the variables and a citation at the bottom. Um, so I think that's a good prototype for simpler data sets, but I don't have a great reference for it otherwise. Great, great, great. Um, uh, so I have a question for Joe, um, and it comes up um, in the in the Q and A. Someone says they like what Joe is talking about as far as conceptual development of statistical ideas. So we need to think about what are the pedagogical approaches we need to use to teach students the conceptual importance and idea of many of the computing skills that are integrated um, into stats and data science courses, rather than just learning the how to. And I think this is certainly something that comes up, Joe, in the original Nolan Temple Lang, and it certainly resonated through a lot of these papers as we did the reviews and, and exploration. Do you have any other kind of thoughts on that front? Well, I mean, um, Holly Lynn, thank you for being here. You also have a really, really fantastic paper in the special issue. Um, so sorry, I didn't I didn't highlight every single one of them. So apologies for that. But what Holly Lynn and her collaborator did was they um, they watched students code and they trans uh, they had the students sort of talking through what was what was on their mind and what were the choices they were making and where they were getting stuck and whatnot. And then they they took those transcripts and they they um, they just you know, worked through some of the, the big aspects of that. And I think that, um, as you mentioned in the chat, Holly Lynn, that, that, um, that, uh, you know, data science research or data science education research rather is a field that has so much room to grow because we really are just embarking on how we understand, uh, how this computational thinking, um, you know, how we can teach it, how, how it impacts what the students know, how it impacts how they learn, all of that. So um, I, I don't have any great ideas except to say that I'm totally on board with, with your work and, and with these ideas. And that I think that sort of parsing through some of the, the things that, you know, that we've been talking about today um, will lead, I hope, to some really good research on, um, on, on some, of these, some of these topics. Great. Um, so uh, the great questions in here about what could be happening at the high school level and other kinds of parts and pieces. Um, but I guess we're, we're starting around a time we have time for really for one more question. Um, there's a question here, uh, a statement, I'm amazed at how well the Nolan and Temple Lang topics identified in 2010 are still relevant today. And it really, if you take flash out of that, it's actually pretty, pretty darn good. Um, um, this is a true rarity when comp compared to most technology forecasts. Um, 
And so the, the, you know, the question asks, I'd be interested in panelists' thoughts about what aspect of today's environment are most unanticipated from what might've been expected 10 years ago. And I'm gonna give by some time for Alex, Mina, and Joe in that order to answer it by answering my sense of what's most unexpected. I think what's been most rem remarkable to me has been the development of professional grade open source tools with a community around them that has helped to make them much more straightforward, round off a lot of the rough edges, make them coherent, and to kind of really come up with things that are better. Now R from day one as S, before S plus, was designed with interfaces in mind. And so the idea that the tidyverse could provide a coherent and opinionated approach to that I think has allowed us to kind of really bring that down to a much more straightforward audience. People are teaching tidyverse based things now in middle school, high school, particularly when you bring your own server um, and other kind of technologies like that. I think as well, the development parallel side of Python, um, I'm pretty clear that any undergraduate statistics student needs to know both Python and R. They need to be expert in one and they need to have familiarity with the other. Because Murphy's Law means they're going to get a job at some cool place, as Alex says, quite possibly making more money than all of us together um, in, in that new job. It'll invariably be a different set of technologies um, that they're going to be using. But I think that idea of really the tools that are here now, it's not money that's the impediment for it. The cost of computing has come down, the power of the tools has gone up, and the price has gone nearly to zero. So that would be my sense. Alex, any thought on this question of what's most unanticipated from 10 years ago? Well, first I have to play my excuse, which is 10 years ago, I was a physics major, so I wouldn't have known what to expect 10 years from then in, in the world of statistical computing. Uh, but I think possibly I'll pick a pedestrian answer, which is just how true it was that computing became such an enormous and important thing. And I don't just mean part of the, as part of the curriculum, but how true it was that um, the demand for data um, and the amount of statistical computing going on in the world expanded by orders of magnitude from 2010 or from 2000 uh, to now, uh, to the point where, you know, all of our programs, I'm sure many of you are experiencing your program is probably five, 10 times bigger than it was 10 years ago. Um, and all of the software that Nick mentioned has become available because so many people are trying to do these things and they're contributing to the software. Uh, just the size of the need, I think, is dramatic and has surprised a lot of people who were teaching um, and running programs focused on sort of this traditional, you know, statisticians work in pharmaceutical companies running clinical trials model uh, to the now everyone does statistics in every company all the time model, it would have been hard to foresee all of that. Great. I mean, unless you were spouting marketing buzzwords about big data all the time back in 2010. Mina, your thoughts on unanticipated? I think I have two um, to list. One of them is I think predictive modeling and like model deployment is something I feel like is happening a lot and we are teaching more and more at least the predictive modeling aspect of it. Um, so I feel like that's not like as present in at least that Venn diagram. And then the other thing I would say is the title of the paper was computing in the statistics curriculum. And if you look at that Venn diagram, and maybe you take out a few things, but not too many, and it could be computing in the political science curriculum too. So I think similar to what Alex mentioned, not only did computing become important within statistics, but in other disciplines that heavily use statistical uh, methods, um, computing has become equally important and they teach their students as much and we teach their students as much as well. Joe, you get the last word. Yeah, it's unfortunate because I don't have anything really um, good to say, but I guess, you know, it's, I, I don't know that I would say this is unanticipated. That's maybe why I'm struggling with the, the question, but like one of the things I've been most pleased about, let me say it that way, 
is um, is how the the community and and of course I mostly know R, but I think this is also true with things like Jupyter notebooks. Um, we've been able to create really openings for so many levels. And Nick sort of said this, but just just and and Mine with the political science, you know, just how broad it's become and how powerful it's become at just really so many different um, uh, entry points, entry levels. So so it's just really more of like uh, just it's so exciting and it's so fun to be really part of the part of this. Yeah, Joe. And again, I'm just thinking, you know, we've heard a lot about, and we mentioned in several of the papers, the Berkeley Data 8 uh, program and the infrastructure they put together there, which has allowed students coming out of Data 8 to go into other classes and start to dream notebooks for their instructors. It's been like literally this kind of group of students who are evangelizing the use of data to kind of make the world a better place and to solve complex problems, which is really, I think, what got us all excited and involved in this. So again, it's the hour is nigh and um, I'm excited, enervated. I hope you are as well. Uh, we've given the links in here for um, the editorial, other papers. As you know, the Journal of Statistics and Data Science Education is an open access uh, journal that welcomes submissions on these topics. And there's no paywall, there's no author fees for that, um, uh, published by the American Statist uh, Statistical Association. Cause, again, it's, a, it's a, available for us. Registration rates for conferences, $25, I believe, is the US COTS fund. So I encourage you all to get involved. It's This is our future and I'm really excited about it. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great day.